So uh, this is uh, Weaponizing the Web, More Attacks on User-Generated Content. I'm Nathan Hamill. I'm a senior consultant for ID Information Security. I'm also an associate professor at UAT, which I saw some of my students here running around at one point. Um, I also founded the Hexagon Security Group, and uh, apparently as of a couple days ago, I became a 23rd degree Mason, and I'm a lava rolling enthusiast. Yeah. More on that later. More later. And uh, yeah, Sean Moyer, um, I work for a, a company called Fishnet Security, um, often described as the douchebag with the microphone. Um, in this case, I'm actually the other douchebag with the microphone. So, so we have kind of a you know, binaural kind of thing going on. Uh, Self-styled Wikipedian and uh, shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. So. That's good. So yeah, just kind of a um, overview of sort of where we're headed, and I guess I would say kind of bear with us. Some of the things that we're, we're talking about, we kind of have to, to set up a little bit. Um, but y yeah, just kind of the first part of the talk is just kind of some overall observations about sort of what is wrong on the internet today, you know, and such. Um, and sort of talking about user-generated content and the democratization of misinformation, right? So, you know, if you think about it, like 10 years ago, you know, you could only be misinformed by your local newspaper or your TV news, and now anyone has the ability to misinform somebody else, you know? So that's, you know, it's kind of the beauty of the internet, right? And sort of, you can probably hit that if you want. Uh, what we're starting to see on the web is there's really not that many one-way conversations on the web anymore. So long gone are the days of visiting somebody's GeoCities page, which I don't know why you'd want to go there anyway. I but GeoCities. I believe <laughs> Jason Scott has an archive. I mean, so if you really you know, just need to have that fix. So there's a lot of two-way communication. And in this two-way communication, everything is communicating with each other and becoming this more social animal. So you, you end up having aggregation points and feeds, and you end up integrating other people's content into your application and allowing other people to integrate your stuff into their stuff. Yeah, and sort of also, you know, and we've, we've mentioned this a lot, you know, there's sort of a features arms race that, you know, so everybody's scrambling to add, you know, new functionality to their sites, and that kind of creates some sort of emerging attack surfaces that are a little bit different, you know, in terms of the web today. Actual information and content, you know, so, you know, again, so the, kind of the first part will be a little ranty, but then we'll kind of get to that, to that stuff. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of talking about what we think is kind of a different approach to, a, to an old bug that's relatively well understood, um, which is, as most people I think probably know at this point, cross-site request forgery. Um, and we sort of are looking at some approaches to get around the, the typical mitigation measures that people put in place um, for uh, preventing that. So, and uh, uh, being the nice uh, people we are, um, some of these new sorts of attacks uh, on cross-site request forgery, we've released a nice little nifty tool that helps you do it much easier. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that also kind of relates to some of, the, some of the demos that we'll run through. Yeah, so we proved that the uh, tool works because all the demos were done with the tool. It worked for us. Yeah. So. It did work for us. <laughs> You're doing something wrong. That's yeah. Good. Actually, and, and don't knock my coding skills, man. Please do. <laughs> yeah, and sort of, yeah, again, some, you know, some observations about sort of multi-site APIs and, and silly things that are, that, are, um, that are out there in terms of some of the, some of the APIs that you're seeing um, across a lot of different sites. Yeah, imagine that. When you expose yourself, there may be vulnerabilities there. I saw that last night somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, you kind of you kind of have to listen to the rants first. So we'll kind of you know kind of run through some of that, and then uh, and then we'll get to uh, to the rest. So, um, kind of again, sort of the overall topic here is user generated content. Um, this is you know basically just the concept of of sites where the content is driven by the user base, and that at at one point you know that might apply to a specific subset of sites. But what we're finding is more and more there's just sort of you know all of that kind of functionality across the board. Uh, but yeah, things like blogs, wikis, uh, social networks, web communities in general, um, again, increasingly kind of bolted on to older sites. And so they're, they're sort of this kind of functionality is, is getting integrated sort of everywhere. And by user-generated content, the user doesn't have to be like an end user. I mean, this could be a developer as well. So in a lot of these applications, the developers are actually the users as well. So there's, their small apps that they build are actually user-generated content. We kind of got into this a little bit. Um, aggregation points. So you may have you know, accounts on multiple pages, 
uh, and you want a way to aggregate those so you only update once and you aggregate too many. Um, who would have thought there'd be vulnerabilities there, right? Um, increasing uh, client side logic. So sharing more of that logic on the client side can lead to greater vulnerabilities, more information leakage, and we have screenshots. <laughs> yeah, so actually, you know, kind of part of what got this got me contemplating some of these things was uh, was Marble Cake also the game? So I'm kind of looking around the room, and you don't have to raise your hand, but is everybody is everybody sort of familiar with that particular turn of phrase and its relevance? No? Yes, I would think some people here might be very familiar with it, you know, presumably. Um, yeah, the Black Hat audience was not so sure, you know. And I, I think I think we're I think we were the first people to mention. 4chan. Well, you got one woo anyway. Yeah, one woo. woo. I did get a woo. Um, but you know, the, the thing that's kind of interesting about that. So, the, so the story is for for those that don't know is that is that Moot from 4chan, you know, was actually nominated, you know, for Times Person of the Year poll that they do every year. So they do this, you know, sort of the, the most influential persons on the internet or something along that line. And, uh, you know, so that, that gathered, co- you know, the attention of that community. And um, so what, what kind of became interesting about that was, you know, the, the first plan was just to, to have Moot win, right, just to get him to the top. And so that was done with, you know, some auto voting scripts and things like that. And then people decided that that wasn't challenging enough. So they decided to um, have all of the votes spell um, an acrostic um, in order that spelled the phrase marble cake, also the game, for the, you know, for the time person of the year poll. So um, the way that that was done was through a whole bunch of different logic that went through and prioritized different people who had the appropriate letter for their first name and watched you know, how the score you know how how many votes went where, and set went through and set that up, and then it got kind of interesting because at one point you know uh, Time Magazine tried all these different ways to circumvent, so they added CAPTCHA and they added what they thought was a tokenization method for the voting process and all of that, and they actually ended up all the people that were working on that found out you know a way around sort of everything that they put in. And the I think the end totals here was like. Twelve million nine hundred and thirty-nine thousand votes for Moot. Um, yeah, and then uh, one point six million for Atwar Ibrahim, who just happened to have you know an A in the name. But but yeah. So, but the the sort of the larger point of this though is what what I thought was really nifty was that Times' response to that was, oh well, you know, internet polls aren't true, and so you know. That just that just happens, you know. You you don't need to worry about that. Um, but you know, they predict the you know presidential race, which way it's going to go from online polls and things like that. So you know, you know, everything on the internet isn't true. I guess was was their answer to that. Well, it's a good thing the polls for the presidential election weren't hooked into 4chan. Yeah, <laughs> might have been a different election there. I don't know. So yeah, and kind of related to that, um, when. Uh, you know, after the after the Michael and some people here know this. So, um, after Michael Jackson's death, there were sort of a series of these kind of copycat copycat hoaxes um, of other celebrity deaths. So it was like Britney Spears and Jeff Goldblum and and uh, some of those things. Um, and and you know this one, which was you know Rick Astley. Um, I'm sorry. I yeah, no, I, I think I, that's <laughs> just wishful thinking because everybody wants Rick Astley dead. So yeah. <clears throat> So, but what's kind of what's kind of nifty about that is that one of the reasons that that was so successful, you know, in recent months for that that kind of misinformation to propagate is because CNN and uh, and then you know as a as a copycat offering Fox News have created this thing called I Report, and then Fox's is You Report. We decide you report, but we decide uh, that uh, that basically allows just random people on the internet to. You know, post their news stories, and it's been it's been really useful. It's also done things like break, uh, actually, the riots in in uh, Iran and and uh, all the post election stuff, and a couple of other things. But it's also been used to just you know create these you know seemingly you know believable hoaxes that have been able to propagate a lot more because of that. And so, uh, actually, this this uh, graphic down gr- down here on this slide is the Star, which is I guess a, a magazine in India that picked up the uh, Rick Astley story and ran with it as if it were actual information. So 
Um, what was he doing in Berlin? He wasn't Rick Rolling in yeah, Berlin. It's well, like, and his, his age was forty three. I thought, I thought that the was Germans good. hated yeah. Rick Astley too. They do. So. Yeah, it, Hasselhoff. Now there would be there be you know, <laughs> yeah. people that would be people crying, crying in the streets in, yeah. and stuff. Um, but, and then also just sort of another point to that. Please stop Rick Rolling. <clears throat> just just stop. It's not funny. Eighteen months ago, it was funny. Okay, I mean, we said it died last year at DEF CON, so you know, hopefully, it is completely dead. And and we suggest as an alternative, lava rolling. And you'll see so, what that is yeah, here so, if you're not familiar, which I'm sure half of you probably really are. the entire goal of this talk is just to propagate that. So, so last year, uh, I have. <laughs> Okay, I might just have to show the picture. Um, we were we were talking about uh, and yeah, sort of talking about last year related to social networks about people's information that gets exposed and in, in, yeah. you know ways that they don't I was, expect. I was talking with my coworker and I said, "Hey, you know, we're doing some hacking on social networks." And, he, and I said, "Hey, do you have a MySpace page?" He's like, "Yeah," and you know, so he gives me his MySpace page. He adds me as a friend. And, you know, I didn't even think about it. You know, I didn't go look at his pictures or anything. I mean, I see the guy every day, you know. So uh, about a month later, I'm at Sean's house, and we're working through some of this stuff. I'm like, yeah, you know, my coworker, you know, added me on MySpace. And I start looking through the, the pictures, and I see – oh, his face isn't covered up. Um, the uh, – <laughs> that, that animation gets me every time. It's like, oh, yeah. Um, so there's this picture of him with this caption that says, does this dress make me look fat? And I, I could not quit laughing. And I'm like, oh, I'm so putting that in the presentation. And then I thought about asking him about it. And I'm like, nah, it's easier. It's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. <laughs> and I just never told him about it, right? So I never told him. And uh, about a month later, uh, you know how you, you use MySpace and it says, and it shows you your photos and it shows photos tagged of you. And this one came up. And uh, as I moused over the picture, the crotch area said Nathan Hamill on it. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, what the hell? So uh, I talked to him. He's like, oh, yeah, my friend uh, said, hey, I saw that picture of you in drag. He's like, yeah, I have it on my MySpace. He's like, no, I saw it at DEF CON. And he's like, (laughs) so he decided to silently tag his crotch area with my name, which that kind of leads to, to some of the bigger things, too. I mean, tags. Uh, the correctness of data, all of that is user-generated content. He had the ability to uh, make me look like an ass. So I had the ability to put this picture back in our presentation. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so another kind of nifty thing with, with aggregation and integration and things like this, I, I, I don't know if, if anybody's sort of familiar with this, but about, uh, you know, maybe about three, four months ago, um, there was a uh, HTML injection problem, which, you know, so HTML in- injection versus sort of XSS, it was like um, dumber than XSS. You could put any tag, you know, any, anything that you wanted into a, into a rebate form on the McAfee website because security companies rock. And, uh, and so it was actually getting used to propagate some malware, so that was, you know, awkward. Um, but, but so what? We, McAfee didn't catch <laughs> malware? No. What? Well, with the next dat, they will they will detect it. Yes, yeah. actually, the next and also version. disable Win thirty two dot Rocking. So, um, so but what was what was cool about that? You know, besides McAfee looking dumb, what was cool about that was that uh, there was this article on Read Write Web, which is this sort of Web two point auto fellatio website where people talk about how you know nifty the internet is or something. But anyway, they had a tutorial on HTML injection where they explain, you know, sort of what it was. And they had this these snippets in there. And if, if people that know sort of web stuff know, you know, if you want to put a code example or something on a, on a web page, you know, you need to escape out sort of the tags. So, you know, it's like and LT semicolon and stuff, right, to, to show that code example but not have it actually be the code. But it's like, you know, here's what URL injection would look like. If you were to do this, then this would happen. You know, it would redirect you over to this site, right? So... The New York Times carried that story by syndication, so they so they had an RSS feed, you know, to read write web, and some developers handling of uh, you know some XML parser you know gone horribly wrong somewhere, um, parsed those tags and actually then the HTML injection example on the article about HTML injection did HTML injection. <laughs> So everyone who read that article, when you went to the New York Times, it then had a pop-up that went to, to uh, the Read Write Web story about it. So what's kind of interesting... They probably thought it was a feature. Yeah, it was, yeah, there was a pretty cool, you know, there's a little pop-up ad for them. Um, 
but sort of the larger point of that is, and there's a, been some stories about, I don't know if, if people know uh, the be Twittered application. It's like a Google gadget. I don't use that stuff. Um, but it's a, it's a Google gadget that goes on your like iGoogle page. And there was an XSS in the app itself, right? And it didn't work on the app. So it was like if you change your Twitter name to script alert foo, right? It didn't work in Twitter. And it didn't work, you know, if you went to some other client site. But in iGoogle, it did. So it xss you, you know, in your iGoogle. Uh, so the, the point of that is all of this integration then creates this shared exposure. And sometimes the way input gets handled on one site when it gets aggregated over, it might be handled completely differently. So even if you're not exposed, you're, you might still be exposing somebody else. Speaking of which, the shared exposure. Yeah. So is everybody starting to get a uh, good idea of just the broad scope of user-generated content? Because typically, if you ask somebody about user-generated content, they're going to think of photos, maybe uploading some music. But it's really a much l larger issue and a much larger problem. Homemade amateur porn as well. Yeah. We, we, that does qualify. Yes. The record. If it's shared on the internet only. Otherwise, it's not. <laughs> so what we're getting into is this big social creature called the web. And we all share a bunch of information. So the web is really becoming a collection of user-generated content. So with many sites uh, aggregating their functionality, it's all about attacker return on investment. So if you have, uh, you don't necessarily need remote code execution to attain your attack. So if there is a goal that you have and there is a shorter distance to that goal, then it really doesn't matter if you have some, you know, brilliant, you know, vulnerability that you exploit that took you like 10 months and, and you've just been banging away on it and then you get pissed off because somebody patches something and then you have to go back to the drawing board. So the, some of this stuff is much easier than that. So, and so sort of on attacker return on investment, like sort of the point of that, what, what I sort of think about is like, you know, if I want to propagate malware, um, you know, links, URLs, and stuff. You know, and that's that's a lot of. You're the gonna game. put it in a Rick Astley video? I, yeah, probably. That's a good place for it. Um, that's you know. That'll teach people to Rick Roll. Only only Flash Studio a day. You know, goes in there. But um, friend feed and all of these aggregation feeds that people Ping. use so they can annoy the living shit out of everybody else who follows them on Twitter and, and Facebook by you know publishing the last 15 websites they went to or whatever. Um, you know. Your credentials are shared across, you know, five, six sites. That's a, that's the most efficient way to propagate links and URLs. And you know, sort of along the same line, on uh, on Twitter, they recently added the uh, trending topics section, so you can kind of see what you know. I don't know, Britney Spears or whatever it is that everybody else is is putting a hashtag around. You know, and you're actually seeing people use that then to propagate malware and do SEO kind of things because they just ride on top of that tag knowing that a bunch of other people are going to click on that. So it then gives them an ROI. So, yeah. so we'll get into uh, some more of the technical yeah. details of attacking APIs. And uh, what you can do since the web is becoming this more social animal, um, we're kind of conditioning uh, everybody to think of legitimate software as kind of having malware tendencies. So in the past, you know, malware was the only stuff that kind of phoned home and stole information from you and everything else. Now it just doesn't even ask your permission. It just says, hey, I need to go check this license file or, you know, hey, um, I will help you out by letting you know when there's an update. So we're kind of conditioned to this behavior of, um, you know, of thinking of legitimate software as, you know, taking advantage of malware tendencies. And uh, on the web, with everything becoming more social, the, the kind of, you know, blended threats. So using a social mechanism to implement a technical attack is much easier now. Oh, I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself. Yeah, that's well, no, that's okay. You know, that's kind of, I was wondering where that slide was. It was like, I hope it's sort of right there. Um, yeah, sort of along that point is, you know, things like Google APIs and Amazon Web Services, um, you know, those those are basically this giant JavaScript sandbox that half of the sites you visit sort of run in. You know, which so the, again becomes kind of interesting. You can't you can't log in or do like half of the functionality on a lot of sites anymore without allowing you know GoogleAPIs.com, right? Well, unless you want to know how many d characters you have left on your Twitter. Yeah, if I you block Google yeah. APIs, you won't be able to I see that. I can't unfollow anybody on Twitter, which is very important to me. And you know, unless I can you know get to GoogleAPIs.com, right? So. 
and and it's that the idea of that again is that those and, and the Amazon Web Services and all of these other shared site APIs then become this kind of conduit through everything. It's kind of interesting. Okay, let's talk about your portal into the web world. Browsers have become more than browsers. They're not just for browsing content anymore. Um, let me show you something really scary. This is Opera Unite. Has anybody ever heard of it? Does anybody here use Opera? One person. That's Did about you, what we thought. How many of those people also work for Opera? <laughs> no? Yeah. Because no? you, you can't actually nominate yourself. So... This is Opera Unite, and it is more than a browser. And, you know, the thing about this is I was like, oh, Median just came out. I'm like, it's this time to find some really cool vaults. Unfortunately, the damn thing wouldn't work in any operating system that I tried it on. But the, uh, if you look, there's this thing called the Fridge. The Fridge, a fun place for people to leave notes on your computer. There is no fun place on my computer where you can drive by and leave me notes. Send me an email, please. Yeah. So yeah. you have file sharing functionality as well because people are really great at determining what on their system should be shared, hence the, uh, the, the uh, location of Obama's safe house um, ending up on LimeWire. And uh, also, too, it has an embedded web server because we've never had problems with web servers before, right? So, and yeah, so you know, you know what this web browser really needs is it needs some, you know, some peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and a web server. You know, that's, that's probably coming in 2.0. Yeah, that's the only thing it's really missing, right? Uh, so, and again, like sort of the point of that too is, you know, so much of what we do is in a web browser, and so the response to that is that build all of this other kind of functionality that, that that's then increasing sort of attack surface, right? So, how many people here use Firefox? That's about what I expected. <laughs> we love you. So, actually. out of all of you people, who has heard of Jetpack? Do you work for Mozilla? Well, I know Greg does because he's seen this talk already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Jetpack is an addition. is something that's coming out from Mozilla Labs. Is something that they're working on. And uh, kind of in the description, it says, um, making extensions for your browser as easy as writing HTML. So now we're going to give all of these morons that can't get it in the first place the ability to extend the browser. That's exactly the kind of thinking no that word, gets us into problems in the first place. No word yet on whether blink tag support will exa exist, you know. So you can have, like, blink tags that, that then integrate with some plugin on your browser. Yes, and I, after, after saying that, um, I saw a Twitter message come by, somebody I wasn't following, and just said, hey, man, these guys are bagging on Jetpack, man. It's not even out of development yet. It doesn't have to be out of development to be scary. It can be scary in development. It's really scary in production. How many people here use Safari? You probably shouldn't, but okay. Um, Stop it. Stop it right <laughs> if now. If you're going to use Safari, please don't use top sites unless you may potentially want to be attacked. So this is uh, Safari top sites, and um, uh, something in somebody told me that it, it doesn't send headers. Um, that's actually incorrect. So whenever you do a control T or whenever you open up a new browser window, uh, what ends up happening is it sends a bunch of requests to refresh all this content. And I'm sure Apple started thinking ahead and they're like, wow, this could be really bad, so let's block Flash and let's block JavaScript. But that kind of assumes that that's in your strategy. Um, since it sends headers, it means it also sends off data back to the application. Uh, so as you can see, if uh, there is a methods to get a malicious page, um, even a social method, right, to get a malicious page on your top sites. And you can have more top sites than these. So uh, it makes you ripe for cross-site request forgery, and uh, which is really bad once you see the monkey fist tool. So you might not want to do that anymore. So if you're going to use Safari, please don't use top sites Ent until they fix the header problem, if they're going to. How many people here use Adult Friend Finder? <laughs> um, <laughs> This is kind of uh, an example of kind of, of bolting on problems. And yes, and every time I talk about this, everybody's like, wow, you know a lot about Adult Friend Finder. Well, when you spend 10 hours a day on a website, you become really familiar with it. <laughs> so uh, it's hard to see in the screenshots, but what this is is a, uh, uh, an error message that popped up that gives you the name of the admin site where all the admin functions come from on Adult Friend Finder. Um, I had to find a, the videos that I tried to find. I tried to find ones without people in them uh, because the ones, some of them were very bad. Uh, on the other side here, um, 
they had kind of bolted on this uh, chat infrastructure. So it allowed you to do instant messaging and chatting and everything else. Uh, well, when I started t- taking a closer look at it, I realized it was just Jabber. So I opened up iChat, and I started trying to chat with people. And what I found was is that you can actually run a chat bot from this. Because if you wait, it's just a Jabber client. You could script your responses, and that's what a lot of people are doing. Like a lot of people are trying to get you to go different places and, and, and whatnot. And that's why they don't contact you first. They create like this profile of this smoking hot woman, and they wait for you to connect to them, and then they start this conversation. So moving on before this gets any more awkward for Nathan. Um, so like the, yeah, I mean, kind of the larger point here too is again, you know, that a lot of times where these exposures come in on different sites is from bolting on kind of new functionality on top of something. Um, there's also, I, I think, uh, you know, Live Journal and a couple other sites have like added chat functionality and like bolted it on in some kind of way. Well, they, 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 use a, they use a Flash client flash and chat. they, uh, flash what they chat. do is... That sounds super, not going to have any problems there at all. Well, Flash chat on Adult Friend Finder. What they do is they set a policy uh, through Flash that allows you to restrict how many characters and everything you use. If you just connect to the service, you can bypass all of that. You can bypass all of their, their little the, the security stuff. So the exposure continues, and uh, we have many different ways to expose site functionality. Um, everybody probably Google's the most popular right now. Um, uh, Yahoo has Yahoo Open Structure or Yahoo Open Site. And um, there's many others. Uh, Google has some new stuff coming out that uh, haven't really had a chance to take a look at yet. But uh, they're kind of pushing open social to be more than just for social web applications. They're, they're pushing it more to be a total site API. Your bookmark can now friend my bookmark, and that's And that is just hot. Thing. That's awesome. Speaking of hot... This is the new way to consume services. So every site that goes up that wants to maintain any kind of popularity cannot just survive on its own anymore. It needs to have integration. It needs to allow you to be able to consume services on other pages. So pretty much every single site out there now has APIs. Oh, another thing about uh, a lot of the way these companies are implementing APIs, they're kind of separating themselves on a different canvas, um, which that's not really a good idea because uh, they're putting everybody, uh, even though it's off the main domain, they're putting everybody in a separate subdomain, which means that if you if you make an, an application for any kind of site, it doesn't have to be a social network site, if you make an application and push it, you can call built-ins in other people's applications. So if for some weird reason somebody was setting you know, a cookie in, in a social network application or any other type of application, uh, you could just call that same value. Yeah, and like I say, when we've sort of we've hit on this pretty hard, but any, anytime you're able to get into that same sandbox, you know, you can, by definition, you can get anything else running in that sandbox, uh, you know, any of that functionality, with the exception really of if people filter inside their APIs certain calls, but you know, I mean, that's kind of like that's like you know the input filtering game with with cross site scripting. You know, there's always going to be some filter, some input that's been missed. So API stacking. Um, at any given point in this structure, you can have vulnerabilities. So a lot of times, like you have, you may have an aggregator that also exposes an API. Uh, so you have to assume if you open yourself up for uh, an API to be have your site services be consumed, you have to understand that everybody can consume those services now. Because you can't really stop another site from opening up an API and then allowing you to consume their, or allowing them to consume your services and the endpoint be by proxy. Um, Here's an example of kind of anonymizing an attack through APIs. So we have a lot of APIs that that call functions that allow you to get past browser security restrictions. How do we know this? It's documented. So if you just read the API documentation, it'll say this function allows you to get past um, browser security mechanisms because they don't let you make calls for content off of a domain. Well, there's a reason they don't do that. Um, Gosh darn you, same origin. I'm <laughs> going to find a way around you so I can make this application work. That's So... Uh, kind of messing around with the APIs, it's uh, possible, and and this is kind of an open social thing. Um, You can call 
the proxy function directly with uh, absolutely no credentials. So for as long as you can make that URL, whatever, you know, however much length you can do, as long as it's properly encoded, it will make the call for you as long as the request is proper. So in, in the example of uh, Monkey Fist, uh, which we will get to here in a little bit, you could put your um, ID source as a chain of these open social proxies and go right through them, and the endpoint has no idea where the request really came from. So uh, continuing on the open social path, apparently nobody ever thought that um, you know filtering out 127.001 on any uh, API proxy call uh, might be a good idea. Um, what this is here, this is uh, uh, High Five's um, open social implementation. And um, that page right there is the home page of the developer box. So, and this works for whatever port number you want to throw in there. And I will let your imagination fly with that one. And uh, I wrote a tool in like 10 lines of Python to like enumerate this and that will not be coming up today. Uh, another thing you can do with these is you can get one site to attack another site and vice versa. So there's um, protection mechanisms and I, and I talk about open social a lot because that's just kind of, I didn't have to go anywhere else to look for examples of this. They kind of had everything really needed. So is there anybody who works for Google in here? Thank God. Damn. Oh, you're just not admitting it. That's cool. Um, so these, uh, th Google did think that it was a bad idea to continuously follow redirects forever because that would be dumb, right? You'd have this big loop. So they're like, you can't follow more than seven redirects uh, because that would be bad. However, if you call the API itself, so if you did 127001, and then called the request again, it would just continue to go and go and go and go and go because it was a new request each time. It only followed one redirect. The same thing can be done for something like a, a triangle of death attack. I, I wanted a really super sensational term for something that could be like, oh, well, that's just kind of okay. But uh, <laughs> you can have... <laughs> We've been in the security industry for a while, so we, we're working on a jacking name for this. Yeah, you know, so this is a, a, triangle jacking. API redirect jacking. So... You could potentially get one site to attack another site and so on and so forth and hit a redirect and start the loop all over again. So it would look like a new request each time. So each time it's called, it would look like a new request. And as many of these as you could light off, the more resources you consume and so on and so forth. So essentially, you know, MySpace's API attacking High Five's API, which is then attacking LiveJournal's API. Dude, why so are you attacking me, bro? Get out. Where's the love, man? So. Okay, and now let's break some stuff. So how many people here are familiar with cross-site request forgery? Okay. okay how many people here think it's bad? How many people who don't know about it but still think it's bad? <laughs> okay, thanks. How um, many people think it's super and awesome? <laughs> okay. Now, now if we made, made cross-site request forgery even more dangerous, how many people would think that was awesome? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. now we're just being good. It's early in the morning, and we're trying to keep you yeah. awake. So, I mean, kind of the larger point of this, this is like, you know, it's sort of like this old vulnerability. I mean, the, you know, the, this has been under, understood since, you know, it really, actually, the Pete Watkins paper, it's a, actually, it's just a post debug track, but that was kind of the first person to really just, like, nail it down on what it is. And it's not actually the confused deputy. And if you know what that is, that's actually about mainframe stuff. So there. Because everybody always says it's that, but yeah. And it, if you if you even care about that, then you're a dork like me. We don't but, care about history. We just want to break <laughs> stuff, man. Up. But sort of the larger point of this is kind of where we're headed with this is that it's you know it's it's very tough to audit for. Um, you know, usually sort of automated applications. It's it's very tough to to identify there. So we think it's fun because we can actually sit and find things that are new and nifty. Um, and you know the guys that have the the talk after us, I think they have like what like ninety seven CVE IDs from the last year or so, you know, for for different CSERF bugs, and so it, it's a lot of fun to look for. Um, kind of our point is that it's typically described as sort of a static attack, where it's like a couple of known values, known parameters, you know. And we did a lot of stuff last year. People have been doing that since like the you know the early nineties of like you know action equals log out on some website or you know send funds, you know, with your PayPal account number, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, usually, when people think of being able to do uh, 
cross-site request forgery on a per-user basis, right? So it's it's a sort of a something that the parameters that you're that you're C surfing are specific to that individual request. Um, that's usually something you think of as being just for the payload for an XSS. So, like one of the classic examples of that is the SAMI worm. So, you know, the way that SAMI propagated, um, it was sort of uh, combine actually a, a bunch of things. And people are still trying to figure out what the hell to call it. But you know, a big part of that was it was XSS that then used the JavaScript to enumerate people's usernames uh, that were on their you know top heroes list or whatever it was so that it would know where to insert itself. And so that's kind of a, a dynamic way of, of doing CSERF that's typically only part of cross-site scripting is the way most people sort of think of it. Yeah, it's, it's really a silly attack. Um, you know, I, I broke a Motorola router, and I never got a CV for it because I said it was dumb, but Motorola does not have a sense of humor. Yeah. Neither does AT&T. Yeah. And yeah, and sort of with the yeah silly bad or or you know really really bad. I mean, uh, obviously you know Grossman and, and uh, a number of other people have spotted bugs in things like Gmail. You know, using this, um, you know, the ability to reset people's passwords, uh, disable firewall rule sets. Um, there's, I think, somebody here at, here at DEF CON. I don't know if it's been today or uh, or if it's it's to, you know yesterday about doing a talk about the uh, two wire modems, the AT and T modems, and uh, there was a actually one of the largest sort of mass sea surfs that happened there was of a bunch of people in in Mexico via a phishing email that then like changed their DNS settings so that they would you know go through malware sites and stuff like that it, and again just via sea surf. So can, yeah. any anything with a web server can be attacked whether that's uh, the local host local network or uh, websites and applications. Uh, and we're just going to go past this because we want to show you something cool. This is. Uh, uh, this is Newsweek.com, and I'm going to go back for a second. Yeah, actually go back. Uh, this is Newsweek.com, and this is still live, so be nice, please. Yeah. Um, and we used uh, Monkey Fist to pull this attack off, yeah. and we'll talk about that yeah, in a second. Actually, and I, I want to say one thing, because I thought really hard about that um, link, and it doesn't show up in the video long enough, is you know, sort of our example scenario here is, um, which you'll, you'll see there's an article that somebody logs into Newsweek and then clicks on it, and, and the article title, which I thought was, you know, pretty nifty, and you know. Yeah, you thought it was nifty because you wrote it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it was yeah, funny. Yeah, was uh, you know, Palin. It was an article link that went to, uh, but like Bitly or Is Good or something link, and it said, you know, Sarah Palin resignation link to nude photos? Question mark. You know, so that's kind of the, uh, the our bait in this scenario. So here we go. This is Newsweek.com, and. Uh, as you can see, we're about to log in, and we have Bob logging in with a password of old password. I am so smoking on the laptop, man, just fast. So we're going to log in, and we're authenticated. So here's the link on Reddit with uh, Palin nude photos. And of course, what? Why are we watching Benny Lava? <laughs> Did we just get lava rolled? We're trying. <laughs> Last time we bring it up, I promise. So what happened was there was uh, when that was clicked on, a dynamic page was created with a hidden post. The post contained the password reset to a value of our choice, um, and now we get to see Benny Lava walking up. Prabhu Deva actually is. Yeah, but everybody knows him as Benny Lava. So we'll go back and try to log in again with the old password. And, uh, yeah, we're going to hurry it up a little bit because we want to explain some of the more complex uh, scenarios. But it makes no difference. As you can see, the login failed. So now we're going to log in with uh, epic fail. And uh, that's full of win. Yeah, so. so that works. Okay. So now let's talk about something called dynamic cross-site request forgery. So there's a certain amount of cross-domain referral leakage that happens, especially when you put tokens in the URL or you have these sort of disjoint tokens from sessions, right? So there's a certain amount of those things. Lots of complex examples get ignored when you're talking about standard cross-site request forgery. 
um, you know, and we have diagrams of this. So it's if you're leaking the, the token value, um, what you can do is repackage that token value up into a valid payload. So something that was uh, thought of as protected against uh, can now be exploited again. And if you're crazy enough to think that the session ID is random, so why not use that? That's really bad because that means you can make any request on your page if you can pull the full session data. Yeah, and, and sort of the, the larger point is just, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of C surf out there that's not sort of these static values. It may not even be that there are uh, C surf tokens, which are sort of these dynamic values that are around it. It might be things like the username is part of the request that, that you're trying to forge, and you can't get that without you know dynamically sort of constructing a request on the fly for for each. Yeah, some C-surf. things some things may be you know may require extra bits of information that an attacker may not have, and now they have the ability to get that. Um, so it's typically thought of a higher bar, but and, and for us, like a, a big part of this was that when we would talk to you know developers and, and point out like those kind of bugs, the, the the standard answer that people would say was, oh well, you know you could really only do that if you had like an XSS, right? So that would be harder to do. You know how else could you do that? And sort of our point is, there's a lot of other ways you know to obtain those values besides just via XSS. You know you might be able to log into the site and use the same token. Uh, for different users, uh, you might just be able to enumerate those values, like we said, from the referrer if there's a link to offsite content. Yeah, and so yeah, we sort of wanted to automate the process of of these complicated C surfs that were a little tricky, um, and uh, also kind of related to that, if, if people that follow the sort of web security world uh, about. Um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, somebody did a proof of concept of brute forcing CSERF tokens as well. Which is, we sort of think of that, again, as being kind of a dynamic attack. So in that case, uh, what they're doing is running a uh, piece of JavaScript code that sort of runs through your history, uh, your, uh, your browser history, to try to guess your tokens. And then those can then be used to replay an attack. Yeah. So here's kind of a simple example of a dynamic C surf. It's uh, or basically a re- really complicated example. Yeah, it could be really complicated, yeah. but basically it's one one payload to rule them all. So you can do uh, you can run one basically attack site and uh, handle attacks for multiple domains. Go ahead. Uh, enter monkey fist. Um, it was never meant to be what it became. So don't beat me up too bad on the code changes. Uh, Basically, it's a tool that helps you pull off dynamic sea surf attacks. And all of the scenarios that we talk about are implemented in the tool. The most complicated is the fixation attack, which uh, actually makes requests and fixates data onto a user's session. And uh, we will uh, get to that. But it, uh, it hides attacks through hidden posts, redirects, and uh, it refreshes to a legitimate destination. So kind of how you saw we clicked on the link earlier, and we ended up on a legitimate you know, YouTube page. Um, that's kind of how it works. Yeah. And there's a, uh, so there's, there's like this series of, of different, you know, security douchebag blogosphere, um, you know, a set of opinions about uh, URL shortening services. And, you know, I, I, I don't know that they're bad in and of themselves, but they do condition us to be really stupid about clicking on things that we don't know exactly where they're going to go. And yeah, Twitter's at fault yeah. for that for yeah. only 160 I characters. Believe, I fully blame Twitter. Um, so, I mean, I recommend using, there's like a, a lot of different Firefox plugins uh, that, will, that will do things like, uh, you know, expand those shortened URLs. But so what we do, you know, what we think is kind of a neat payload is to use a, you can use a URL shortening service. We can do CSERF in the middle of that. And then, again, so we take you to a YouTube video or something. It looks like it's performing as design. And that's, that one little request runs, you know, in, you know, one second while you're in the middle of clicking on the link and you're not, it's not typically something people are going to spot. And uh, it's live right now, so if you go to hexec.com forward slash labs, you'll see yeah. the stuff for Monkey Fist. Yeah. Uh, and it will it will steal any session data you want it to that may end up in the referrer and repackage it into a valid payload. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to go through some of the... This is uh, some of the options. Yeah, and so... And essentially, so you, you set up the site that you're going to target. Um, you set up the destination URL you want to send to, and then you can define these different values that you want to pull out. Yeah, the, the site basically is what it's going to match where the refer is coming from, so it knows which payload to pull out of the file. There's a default payload, which kind of makes it a little sneaky. So if you're trying to hide an attack, requesting spacer.gif, and somebody gets wise and they just point their browser to your domain and ask for spacer.gif, yeah. they're going to get spacer. a real spacer.gif. So they may not be able to know exactly yeah. what's going on there. 
and that's because there's sort of the, the uh, refer is the trigger for the payload. So unless you see a specific refer, it's just going to respond with the default. Yeah. And yeah. the destination for the meta refresh. So okay. uh, here's an example, you know, what the, what the XML file would look like. And um, in case there's some, uh, some, you know, confusion about that, um, I got a couple of blog posts coming up in the links in here. And uh, you can uh, read about how to set it up and get it going. So... So a couple of examples. This is a dynamic redirect attack. So the user would make a request for content. Somewhere on whatever page they're on makes a request back to another site that is hosting Monkey Fist. Uh, it will take all of the, the kind of tokenization, whatever data you told it to take out of the uh, refer, send back a redirect with a 302. The user's browser will then send the payload that you sent it back to the legitimate site. So it's a very simple example. They get more complicated. But in, in really, you know, the larger point is just, again, these are, these are per request forgeries. So each time it's sort of constructing that forgery based on data that's getting from the client request. Um, so here's a post construct. So um, basically, uh, in case there was some confusion about this when we talked about it before, um, the user requests content. So if you're leaking full session data in cross-domain fashion, like say you put J session ID in the URL, um, that then hits something on the page which sends data to the tool. The tool says, okay, I have a payload that tells me to construct a post. And the tool will actually construct a post request with all of the session data and send it back to the, this site without the user's browser interaction. So that's how we can create header values. So if we wanted to add our own cookies and stuff like that, we could. And, and actually kind of what's, what's nifty is it's, it, it's sort of a quasi-same origin bypass because... You know the the tool it in the especially like the token stealing uh, you know scenario where it's going out and pulling stuff down it doesn't really care because it's not doing JavaScript you know it it has you do a post with the data that it gets. Right? The funny thing is this is exactly how they're uh, this is exactly how the uh, APIs that were exploited earlier were doing it. So uh, okay, Ooh. so here's the uh, dynamic page. All right. Apparently we blab too long. <laughs> Five minutes. So, uh, so yeah. So something that we thought was kind of cool is like I would look at the the freaking Wikipedia article um, on CSurf all the time, and it would piss me off because it was just really dumb. Because it, it talks about just image tags and things like that. And you know, I, like I said, the thing and the things we're talking about have been understood by a lot of people, you know, the, in web security for a while. But it's all the papers and everything else sort of defining as that. So that just you know it just kind of pissed me off. So um, we decided to edit the CSurf article on Wikipedia via CSurf. So that would be kind of cool. Uh, so here we're going through uh, Wikipedia. As you can see, forging requests, and then you see prevention mechanisms. Uh, so we're on the page, and we want to go buy a truck. <laughs> so we're on Craigslist. Craigslist, St. Louis, in the Jefferson County section. If anybody's from St. Louis, you'll know. So here we go. We're going to click on the truck, and it says, Old That's truck. a $100 truck, man. Shit. $100. There is a uh, shortened URL right there. So when you click on it, uh, some magic happens. And uh, here we are at what? What? So we have some more Benny Lava. Um, and to kind of explain what happened, oh, we'll, we'll refresh this first and show you the payload. As you can see, it's been edited. There's been a new section uh, that says other approaches to CSERF. So... We kind of figured this was the best way to add data about this. And this was also the most complex. Thanks. <laughs> this is also the most complex example of using the tool because there was many things that had to happen behind the scenes. So what we did was take something extremely complicated to pull off and make it really easy. Um, so Yeah, and so, and so sort of to explain, like, so that in the case of that C-Surf, um, it's what's funny is there's a CVE ID for this. Uh, it's it's already out there, but they sort of fixed it for authenticated users, but not for anonymous ones. And so, the thing about it is there's all these different values in the post. If you do a post to Wikipedia and you look at it, there's all these different token values that you need and all this other stuff. And it's mainly yeah. for it's mainly not there as yeah. a quote unquote protection mechanism, but it does kind of thwart some of the attacks because you have to have those values for the request to be valid. Um, it is funny. It is um, funny. So, we watched it about 80 times in the past <laughs> week. So what we had to do was request that data 
on our own without the user's interaction and then package that up into a payload. Yeah. And that's kind of the problem of all these disjoint session, these kind of disjoint session values. Like, like the tokens aren't part or aren't joined with the session, I or the session IDs that are issued by the site. So when that happens, and it happens in many different places, you can go look for it yourself, you can create valid payloads by just requesting the data, getting it back, parsing it, putting it into the request, and sending it on to the user's browser. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to put out like something kind of nifty that with that is that you know the Church of Scientology has been you know banned from making edits to Wikipedia because they've been inserting bias into it. You know, um, but the way that they did that ban was like just sort of their IP ranges. You know, so that, so essentially, if they put like a you know a little link on their website that went somewhere, you know, they could sort of have like billions of anonymous people you know over the internet you know, do their edits for them. So you know. No, no consulting fee required. You know, you could, you can cleanse me of thetans or something later. But, uh. So here's, here's what the payloads file looked like for that attack. Um, we really don't have time to get into it, but it, as you can see, it, it uh, by adding yeah. a couple of values, it made the attack really easy, which would have been yeah. really hard before. Well, and yeah, and sort of the the one point we would make about that is. That and this is how to fix it. You don't want to. You don't care how to fix it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, go look it up. This read is it, usually when everybody article. gets up and leaves a talk. And here's how you fix the problem. Yeah. And then everybody just gets up yeah. and leaves. Don't worry. We're not going to bore you with fixes. Um, but, yeah, I mean, sort of the mitigations for CSERF are well understood, right? It's not um, really like the things we're talking about. It's not sort of a bypass that, that you know, o OMG, we broke the Internet. You know, I mean, we'll try, you know, uh, you know, null string terminators in it and see if that works. But, um, you know, the, the thing is that, in order to mitigate for CSERF, you have to do like a whole bunch of stuff right, and most people do like most of it, but not all of it. So you look at one site, and maybe they check refer. You look at another site, and you know maybe they map tokens to, uh, you know, one token could be reused against multiple users. It's not mapped to sessions. So and it only takes once. If you're if yeah. you leak that token in one spot, gotcha. If you leak it in one spot, it's game over. Um, yeah, and again, like sort of, if you're if you're issuing tokens and CSERF protections in JavaScript, you know, don't assume that same origin is going to help you. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, yes, and bug fixes. Uh, my blog is neohaxer.org, so if you want to have some examples, um, they'll be up soon. Monkey Fist is on hexec.com, and our uh, talk will be uploaded there shortly. Thanks. Thank you.